Uh, good morning, GMC family and friends. Thank you to those of you that are tuning in from different parts of the world. We're always grateful to the Lord for allowing us to get connected for the purpose of worship and also to receive an increase in our understanding of God's Word. And I'd like to thank you especially for taking the time to tune in and also to thank you for your prayers and your support. We appreciate you and everything you've done to support the Word of God. Now, last week I told you that we are going to dwell on the topic of holiness and uh, last week's message was just uh, uh, laying the foundation. I, it is my goal as a servant of the Word to help you have a clear, uh, simple understanding of this. Uh, one of the very important uh, topic in the Word of God. So today I'm going to just build upon that foundation and I hope and pray that you will have the, the patience to just uh, walk with me, stay with me as I continue to open the Word of God for your understanding and for your benefit. I don't mean to say that I have the ability to open the Word, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But I'm under the understanding that it is my role to talk and to show you some things in the language that we can understand and it is the work of the Holy Spirit to make things happen. So again, our reading this morning comes from 2 Peter chapter 1 and today we're going to focus on verse 5, 6 and 7, 8 and 9. So let's pray. Father, we are so uh, glad that we're all united in one heart and one spirit through the work of your Holy Spirit who has been with us, uh, who is here with us to open your word to us. Father, I ask for the anointing to be upon me as I do my job to explain May this explanation simple, may be it simple and clear enough for our people to understand. I hope that they will share the same understanding that you've given me. Father, I ask that you will give us the courage. Allow us to see ourselves in you and depart from the old understanding to where we focus so much attention on experience when it comes to the topic of godly living and holy living may we begin to move away from our experience and focus on your word build our faith upon your word and everything else that comes along with it may they all be from your word I thank you, Jesus, for the increase that we're about to receive today. To you be the glory, the honor, and the praise. To you all power, your kingdom. In Jesus' name I ask, amen and amen. Well, it's about holiness again, and today the emphasis is on our part. It will serve you well if you could remember the house that I talked to you about last week. It serves as a good analogy that will illustrate our relationship as church people, as uh, unique denominations, where I told you that we are all of the same house that belongs to God. There's only one house, there's only one body, but many members. House with many rooms. You belong to one room and I belong to the other. It is the Holy Spirit's calling and placement. 
that we ought to respect, that we ought to understand and embrace and learn to appreciate the contribution of one another because this, these contributions are the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our ministry, in our service. So that way we don't have to feel bad when we listen to the Word of God coming from whatever room that it comes from. We don't feel out of place or alienated. Now we don't feel like we don't belong. No, we don't. We may not feel belong in that room, but we belong to the house where that room belongs to. So today I'm going to talk about the second house. These are all analogies that I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will use that as an instrument to help you understand what it means to live holy lives here and now. Not to wait some other time, but here and now. Holiness is, a, is part of of redemption and salvation. So every time we talk about grace, it's a coin of two sides. Grace on one, holiness on the other. We cannot speak of grace and ignore holiness. We cannot speak of holiness and ignore grace because they're one and the same thing. And like I said uh, again, it is the mission of the Church of the Nazarene in the world not to preach a message of holiness as if it's a new message, as if we are the only one preaching it. No, holiness is the privilege of the whole church, everyone that belongs to Christ. Everybody talks about it, everybody understands and knows about it. In every room of our house, we know about it, we strive for it, we dream of it. It's our desire to live holy lives here and now. But it is the mission of the Nazarene Church to insist and remind so that the church will not forget. Not only to insist and remind, but to set examples so that the people of the entire house will understand that God is not talking about something that it's impossible to do or to have. No holiness, living godly lives, is possible now to all children of faith. And today, we're going to look at a few scriptures that I've selected, and you will judge it for yourself. And I'm telling you, the moment you begin to see these things that the Word talks about, it's going to change your mind. It's going to change your life. Change in a way that will help you receive, that will help you reap the harvest of righteousness, that will help you grow in your faith, grow in your life in Christ. It's the goal of God. That we learn from his word, understand it, apply it, and grow. Praise God. Now let me just uh, look at verse 3, just to remind you of where we're going. His divine power. Now let me take it back, further back, go up to verse 1. Through the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ, have you have received a faith as precious as ours. You have received faith, a precious faith. Then His divine power has given us everything, everything we need for a godly life through a knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness, so that through the promises and the great many things that the divine power has given us, 
We may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Verse 3 tells us, he has given us his divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life. He hasn't left anything out of this. He gave us everything we need. But verse 5 tells us that's his part. He gave us everything we need. We're talking about the Creator. We're talking about God that knows it all. He understands and He knows what we need. So He's given us everything we need so that we could participate in His nature, His divine nature. And as we participate, as we continue to participate, in his divine nature. What is going to happen? We will experience a slow but sure departure from the corruption of this world. The corruption that is caused by our own evil desire. The evil desire of the old self. Before we receive a precious faith that we now have. But now the emphasis is on our part. For this reason, to make the process work, for God to work within us, it is our job to make every effort to add to this faith that we have. First, goodness. And I want to use an analogy again of a house. This is the second house. To demonstrate this faith that we have. Here in America. And I'm sure it's like that. In other places other than Samoa. You, you're looking for an apartment or a house. You call the real estate uh, agent. Set up an appointment for a visitation. So you come and take a tour of the house. And when you open the door, you go in, the house is empty. Let's say that you like the house, you, you can afford it, it's beautiful. You feel like home already in the house. But it's empty. This faith that we have comes through the righteousness of God that it was right in the mind and the heart of God to give us this faith. It's a precious faith. It's not of this world. This is a product of the righteousness of God. The right life. The true life of God. But now we have it. But it's empty. It's a house for us to live in. It belongs to you now. It's your faith. Yet it's empty. It's precious. But it's empty. It doesn't have furniture. It has no refrigerator. No beddings. Nothing. No curtains. It's your job to fill it up. And when you fill it up, over here it says, do not leave out anything. Make every effort. God does his part. He gave us everything that we need. It's our part now. To make every effort to add to our faith. To start bringing the stuff into this empty faith that we have. You're probably wondering why uh, in your life you look at your experience you don't seem to see any signs of a holy living, the holiness of God. That's probably why you are living in an empty house. Your faith is empty. You may worship the Lord our God doing everything that you know what to do. But the fact of the matter is when it comes to living holy lives, 
when it comes to our participation in the nature of God. Remember we're from this world, but we're not of this world. This is where we live now. But our citizenship is in heaven. Our nature may start it off with our human nature here on this earth, but now we can participate. God is opening himself to us. That's where our godly lives flow from. That's where the power to live holy lives flows from. But we got to understand it is God's process that he does his part and you and I do our part. He already declared I already gave you. The divine power of God has already given us everything we need. It is now up to us. It's now our part. And this is where I wanted you to listen very carefully. Because a lot of times you often hear people confessing their desperation, their need of God. And when they receive the Holy Spirit, when they receive Christ, this precious faith, then the expectation is that God is going to act. And God is going to fill up the house. But here we have it. For this reason, in order for the process to work, in order for us to live happily in this precious faith, this precious house that God has given us. We ought to make every effort to add to our faith, add to your faith. And I add to my faith. First, goodness. Does faith reflect goodness? I'm not talking about the goodness that we have as humans. No, this goodness is the goodness of God. God's goodness always promotes, actively promotes truth and righteousness. These are things that we don't have here. These are qualities that God has. But now the teaching tells us, make every effort. It's our job. It's your job to add this goodness of God to your faith. The faith that you have, it's precious, but it's empty. There's a part of scripture that talks about showing the work to show your faith. That faith without work, it's a dead faith. But most often people talk about work, they talk about the physical works. That is part of it. This is the more important work of faith. Goodness. Add to your faith goodness. And the goodness of God is, is, serves to promote truth and the righteousness of God. The reason why we say God is good, because God is always true to his word. That God is always righteous in his judgments. There is no lie in God. There is no half truth in God. There is no wrong in God. There is no injustice or evil or unfairness in God. God is always true and always righteous. The goodness of God ought to be reflected in us who have this precious faith. The question is, is your faith reflecting the goodness of God? How does that work out in practice in your life? Do you feel the desire to always stand on the truth? Always true to your word. Do you always feel the desire to delight yourself in the righteousness of God? That you don't embrace evil of any kind. That in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, 
Everything about you is about the truth and the righteousness of God. That's the goodness of God that you ought to add to your faith. Now, how do you do that? Practice makes perfect. I know it's hard. Time consuming. It's uh, frustrating at times. Because the nature, the evil desires in us always attack, always go against the will of God. When we're needed to stand on the truth, we're tempted to stand on something else. What is needed of us to show the righteousness of God, we feel the pressure to stand against it. So what we do, this is the battle we fight. We fight to condition ourselves. We fight to learn, to stand on his word, stand on his truth. Continue to speak, promote the truth of God. Hold on to his word. Hold on to the righteousness of God. As we continue to do it, that's how we add goodness to our faith. Uh, you remember that empty house? It would be nice. And you say to yourself, well, it would be nice to have a couch somewhere here to sit on. You don't want to sit on the floor. Oh, it would be nice to have a table and some chairs. And now you're beginning to add more furniture, add more decorations. If you don't add, they're not going to just automatically walk in. There's no miracle that will bring them in by themselves. And you don't expect God to come and do it himself. Because he already gave us our instructions. You act. You make every effort to act. It's your job to act. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. To goodness, knowledge. Now, it is the mind that knows. And what the mind knows becomes knowledge. And a lot of times people don't uh, realize that God has given us a powerful part of ourselves, the mind. It's the mind that collects information. It's the mind that analyzes information, processes the information. It's the mind that think about ideas. And here we're talking about the knowledge of the word of God. It's a new knowledge. It's clean. It's, it's, uh, it's purified knowledge. It's the knowledge of the godly life. It's the knowledge of holiness. It's the knowledge of grace. This is the knowledge that we, if we don't make every effort to add it, to our faith is not going to be there. So the first thing that I want you to do is you need to, um, if you haven't done it yet, if you don't know how to do it, it's very easy. Have an open mind. Keep your mind open. You settle with your faith in Christ, great. But now open up your mind. Open your mind to new things. Open your mind to new knowledge. Open your mind so God can, can continue to pour His knowledge into your mind. It's your job to open your mind. Jesus once talked about two wineskins. The old wineskin and the new one and he made a point to that you cannot pour new wine into an old wineskin it will break the wineskin tear it apart and then you waste the new wine so the lesson is if you want to have new wine you got to have a new wineskin and the new wineskin is the same mind renewed retransformed through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, God said, 
The divine power has given you everything that you need. And if you think that the power of the Holy Spirit is not strong enough to move your mind, to expand your mind, stretch your new one skin, how it's going to do it? All you need to do is believe and say to the Holy Spirit, I want my mind to be open now. Yeah, you're watching this and a lot of time a lot of times and it's unfortunate that our people are very most of our Christians are very close minded. And you will tell them that's not what the word says, but they don't want to hear it. Because they've already set they've already settled their minds. They made up their minds, this is where I stand, and they will continue to stand until they die. Not knowing that what they stand on. It's not the truth of God. It's not the knowledge of the word of God. You're standing on somebody's teaching. That was not based on the word. Somebody's opinion. Somebody's word of wisdom. Somebody's knowledge. No. This is the knowledge of God. You got a precious empty faith. It's your job to make every effort to add into that faith. Goodness and to goodness and knowledge. The question is, do you have knowledge? How long ago since you have that knowledge? No, I'm talking about opening your mind and allow the Holy Spirit to pour His knowledge into your mind. Remember, you're filling up this empty house now. You don't want this faith of yours as precious as it is to be empty. You got to add knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. These are simple stuff. Not a lot of times you think you're in control of your life. But it's not hard to look at your mannerism, your attitude, your behavior, your habits. It's easy to tell who's in control. For example, if you love to eat, who's in control? Papa talks about the stomach. Food in control. Now here you need to work, make every effort to add self-control, bring control back to yourself. Bring control back because now you can. You have the divine power supplying you with all the power, all the strength that you need to bring control back to yourself. Be independent. Be sorry. Claim your life back. So when you eat and food try to take that control away, you just practice little steps. Hallelujah. You know, the, several years ago when I first found out that I was diabetic, doctor told me that I was diabetic. I was so frustrated and disappointing. Not that I was disappointed because I was diabetic, but disappointed in myself. I said to myself, man, that was so stupid. How could I let the my desire of sweets take control of my life now I'm in a mess you see so now I'm beginning to learn how to bring that control back I used to love ice creams I tried eating now I couldn't why because I have the control Somebody asked me some years ago and said, well, Tali, there's nowhere in the Bible that says that smoking is bad. Smoking is a sin. And I say, you're right. I don't know. Maybe people didn't smoke those days. Maybe it was not, uh, the Bible was not meant to say that. And then Jesus said, anything that goes in, that comes outside and goes into your mouth is not going to make you bad. It's the, what comes out of you, 
that makes you evil. But then I, I, I felt like I needed to say a little bit about the fact that smoking is bad for your health. And I said, well, first of all, smoking is a health issue. And uh, you ask yourself, are you in control of that? Are you in control of your health? Or the cigarette is in control? And then I also said, well, look, try and stop smoking for a few days and see if you can. Because if you can't, then that means you're in your something is in control of your your life now, and that's idol worship. That's idolatry. Every time you lose the self-control, some spirit, some force is in control of your life. The Bible talks about controlling your tongue, controlling what you see your ears. There's a lot of things that are trying to take away control from us. But now with this precious faith, now with this so much power that we have, it's time to claim that. That's the reason why we, it, makes it, it makes it very hard to live God's lives here and now because we don't have the control of our lives. How can we possibly live holy lives here and now when we are not in control. Make every effort to add to your faith self-control. The question is, do you have control of your life? Now I'm not saying here that don't smoke, but I'm just using it as an example. Try and stop if you can. Try and see who's in control now. If you drink, because drinking is, is not sin, but it could be a problem. It's a cause of problems in our lives. That's why we Nazarenes, we've made a, a commitment not to drink, not to support the industry that is responsible for making all this alcohol that has been one of the number one, one of the main causes of Many problems, many social problems that we have. Divorce, abuse, molestation, murder, uh, car accidents, you name it. It's alcohol related. And I challenge you, if you love to drink, try and see if you can stop it. See what happens. Because oftentimes in my experience, when you try to stop your master, when you try to say no to who or what is controlling your life, ah, it's not going to happen. Try and do it. Your next part or you say to the next part, you know what? I'm still in control of you. Let me put this aside for a month now just to show you that I'm in control. Trust me, you will not survive the first week, maybe a couple of days. Even the smokers, they won't survive two days. Why? Because smoking is no longer a servant. It's a master now. You think that you're taking these puffs just to kill time or just to occupy yourself so you can think? Think again. Food. Clothes. It's nice to grow, uh, to have nice clothes, but you, when you do it in excess, clothes can control you. Luxury, the things of the world, add to your faith self-control, and to self-control, perseverance. You notice that you have this precious faith, yet you found yourself in challenging situations where you run instead of taking the stand, turning your back 
on the testing times that were meant to make you strong, then your solution is to give up, your solution is to walk away, that you don't think that you have the strength to face these challenges head on. The reason why you feel like you don't have strength because your faith is empty. It's precious, you're proud of it, but it's empty. It's not serving you. It's not helping you stand. Now perseverance, you make every effort to add perseverance to self-control. It's the power to take a stand and take a stand and firm, make that stance firm. Now I'm not talking about trying to do it in your own strength, in your own understanding. I'm talking about the power of God. The divine power of God is giving you everything, but it is your job to practice, practice perseverance. And you start out with little things. You don't have to start strong. You start out with small, take small steps. And you practice. You face a challenge, you hold your stance. Instead of running, you face it. Now remember now from other parts of scriptures, all of these trials and temptations that are coming, these challenges that we face, God does not allow anything that is too strong for us to handle. No, He gives it to us not only what is common to every man, every woman, but he gives us the, the one that will match our strength. So you see, God is already doing his part. It is our part to do our, what we needed to do to make the process work. So we learn to persevere. We, we stay determined. Knowing that this is what we need to fill up our precious faith that was empty without these things. And we have the power, we have the resource. All we have to do is move and act and work and practice. Now some of you are watching and are probably at your, you know the, Baseball game, I mean uh, sports, the way they set up the game, you go from base one, base two, base three, then home run. And sometimes you find yourself in a baseball field, like uh, you're in base one, something happened then, you're challenged then, what do you do? You run to base two, and then you get another challenge, Run to base three. Now this time there's no home run for you. Why? Because you always move. You always run. You don't have the strength to stand and face the problems that are coming over. These problems, these are the testings of your faith. These are positives that will help you grow. Help you have the self-control that you need. Help you have the knowledge that you need. Help you have the, the goodness of God that you need to have. All of these qualities, they all work together to fill up your precious faith. Now, make every effort to add to perseverance, godliness. 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 It's about God. It's about the character of God. The behavior of God. The habits of God. The attitude of God. How do we become uh, godly? We work together with God. We cooperate. We participate in the divine nature where God will supply what we need. And we do our part to utilize 
that supply and then enjoy the fruits. Godliness is a job we have to work on. We don't expect God to come and give us godliness. No, we. this is what that you add. This is what we do. The problem is, we start off wrong when we think that godliness is not possible. It's not going to happen. But now with the word of truth, godliness is simple. It is possible for us to add godliness to our precious empty faith. To godliness you add mutual affection. Here he talks about the harmony between people. This is where, remember now we're all babies of the Holy Spirit. Now we all have the, we share the same Holy Spirit. We share the same grace. We eat the same bread. We drink the same cup. Everything we have is common to everybody. So mutual affection is what ought to come out of this unity. This experience of oneness. Where what you feel ought to be felt by everybody. That you ought to feel what the other brother is feeling. If the brother is sad, you ought to sympathize. You could relate to that. That's what it means to live in harmony. When somebody gets hurt, we are hurt by their hurt. When they celebrate, we rejoice with their celebration. That's what mutual affection means. And in something that we need to add, we have to work at it. If we don't do it, it's not going to come naturally. Now let me ask you, is that how your experience has been to where when somebody when a brother falls, goes through a challenging moment, you feel for that brother, that instead of condemning the brother, throwing your stones at the brother, you put yourself in the brother's shoes and you say, I could relate to that. Thank God that I am okay. But my brother, it is time for me to reach out and protect my brother. From the hurt, from the pain, from whatever it is that is facing. Do you see that's how mutual affection works? That we could relate, we could live in harmony. That we could understand and embrace one another, the good and the bad. Their happiness is our happiness. Their pain is our pain. Their hurt is our hurt. Their up times is our up times. Their down times are our our down times. When they go up the hill, we go up with them. When they climb the mountains, we climb with them. When we walk through the valley, we walk through with them. Make every effort to add mutual affection to your faith. Probably right now the reason why the Holy Spirit leads you to this message because your faith is empty of mutual affection. You're inclined to be on your own, independent, reserved. You think that you're, you're, you're isolated from everybody. You don't want to interfere. You don't want to mess with anybody's business. You just keep it to yourself. It is the creation of God that all of us, with our differences, with our uniqueness, be brought together. We preserve our differences, yet we are united. It's called the miracle of God. To see us being so different. We don't look the same, we don't sound the same. Yet we are united in harmony. Because we have added mutual affection to our precious empty faith. To mutual affection, love. 
This is the love of God. We practice the love of God in order for us to add the love of God into our faith. Yes, God has enriched us. He has placed His grace in us. We're given so much. But if we do not practice giving up, sharing it, giving it, especially when at times when we don't feel like giving it, it's not going to be added to our faith. We'll be running around with faith empty of love. First, if we don't do this, faith empty of goodness, faith empty of knowledge, faith empty of self-control, faith empty of perseverance, faith empty of godliness, faith empty of mutual affection, empty of love. Then verse 8 says, For if you possess these qualities, if you possess these qualities, hallelujah, in increasing measure, you got to pay attention to these words. Peter was very careful to make sure that every word counts. Every phrase is exactly what God intends for him to write for our benefit. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, hallelujah, I like this part, in increasing measure. Picture this in your mind. It's an empty house. Let's say you start filling it up with some tables. You start off with four tables. And then you add a fifth one. Add the next one. And what's going to happen? These tables are coming in as they do come in. Then they start taking up space. And then the more of them coming in is going to create a mess. Why? Because your house is already set. In terms of measurement, you cannot expand that house. So what you need to do, you need to stop bringing in more tables. Because you need some space to move around. But this house of faith that I'm talking about, as you bring in the goodness, as you bring in the knowledge, self-control, the perseverance, the godliness, the mutual affection, the love, as they begin to take up space, faith expands. Hallelujah. Faith begins to move horizontally, vertically. It's going to expand. That's how faith grows. That's how faith grows from being empty to being filled up and being filled up some more. And now we have it. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, Hallelujah. The goodness of God in you has the power to increase. The knowledge increases. Self-control increases. Perseverance increases. Godliness increases. Godliness Mutual affection increases. Love increases. In increasing measure. Listen to the end result. They will keep you from being ineffective and productive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. With an empty faith, you're ineffective and unproductive. You're just running around you sound good, you could sing, you could pray, but there are no fruits. You're not producing. You're not effective in your methodologies, in the ways that you are practicing your faith. And now we're told the reason why we're unproductive and ineffective because we lack these qualities. Our faith is empty. 
But now, having them, possessing them in increasing measure, the ineffectiveness and the unproductiveness slowly move out and you become effective and productive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You become fruitful. You're able to produce results. And that's what it's all about. Remember I told you the last time, Jesus said the tree is known by its fruits. With an empty faith, it's hard to expect any fruits. With a faith that is filled with these qualities. With a house that is no longer empty, you can expect fruits. Growth. The growth in the character of Christ, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them, Listen to this. Whoever does not have these qualities. It's talking about a man and a woman of faith. Anybody that has this precious faith. That declare in the, in the open public that they're saved. That they put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. If that's all they do. That all they have. Listen to what's going to happen. Whoever does not have these qualities is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Nearsighted, it's a step next to blindness. All they see is what is in front of their face. They cannot see far. They cannot see the future. With this qualities, you are able to see as God sees it. You may not be able to see all future, but you are able to see farther. Not nearsighted, but you are able to see what's beyond what everybody could see. Blindness. You have a precious faith, yet you're blind. You're Unable to remember that God has already cleansed those past sins. You're still carrying them. You forgot that God has already washed all those sins away. You're nearsighted. You're blinded. Your mind is not able to, re to remember the information well. Because you don't practice. You don't stretch your mind. Brothers. Some good stuff, huh? Do you consider yourself saved? Do you see yourself a Christian? Son and daughter of God? The question is, is your faith empty? Or filled up with these qualities? Now verse 10 says, Therefore, having said all of that, therefore my brothers, and my sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now this may come to you as a surprise. God calls, God elects. And we may think that that's all it takes. We run around and we tell people how proud we are of being called and being elected by God, by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I want you to remember these words. Make every effort to confirm. You confirm. I confirm my calling and my election. If you don't confirm it, and how do you confirm it? By having, by possessing these qualities that we talked about. How do we possess these qualities? 
by making every effort to add it to our faith. We confirm the calling and the election of God by the fruits we produce as we add and continue to add and to have these qualities in increasing measure. We begin to see these fruits coming up. That's how we confirm. So if you're a man of faith, a woman of faith, a brother and a sister in the Lord, and you lack the fruits, the attitude is not good. The behavior is not good. How you carry yourself on a daily basis is just not good. Then you have yet to confirm. We can live holy and godly lives here and now if we do our part. That we don't just let God does His part and we walk around and expect Him to make a miracle so that our part will happen. It's not going to happen that way. He already made a declaration in His Word of our part, what we must do. If you do these things, that's what it says. Make every effort to confirm. And don't you thank God for the Nazarene having them around to knack and insist and remind and push this to you to wake you up and encourage you so that you know we have a part. And here is the, the surprise. And if you do these things, you will never stumble. You may face a disastrous situation, you may get hurt, feel the pain, feel the pressure, but you will never stumble. Base your life on the word, not on the experience. You see people stumbling, don't follow that path, follow the path of the word. The word says, if you have your calling and election confirmed, by possessing these qualities, the qualities that you add by making every effort as a man to do these things, doing them with the understanding that the divine power of God has already given you everything you need to make this life happen for you. Now listen to this. You will have a rich Welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What does this verse imply? I ask that question. The understanding is that when you're saved, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, you're in heaven. You're in the kingdom of God. That's true. But let me break it down based on this verse some other parts of scripture so you to really understand what we're getting ourselves into. When you put your trust and have your faith, your precious faith, you are now privileged to enter the narrow gate. And it is your privilege to walk on the narrow road. That's it. Inside the narrow gate, the gate is the right one now, because if you didn't, you were still be in the wider one, wider gate. You got into the narrow one, you're on the road now, but we are on the road, yet to enter into the eternal kingdom of our Lord. That's what this one says. If you do these things, if you possess these qualities, if you make the effort to add to your empty, precious faith all these good qualities, if you confirm your calling and your election, if you do these things, you will receive a welcome. Not just a welcome, a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My friends, let me put it simply to you this way. Many people that claim to have this faith will not receive a welcome into the eternal kingdom. 
They may be inside the narrow gate. They may be walking the narrow path. But to enter into the eternal only happens when you do these things. If you do these things. It's a conditional statement. If you do this, you get in. If you don't do it, don't expect a welcome. Don't expect a welcome. If you do, expect a rich welcome. Hallelujah. And again, Peter tells us, and that's what we do here. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Hallelujah. Well, I hope and pray that you are you're able to receive this, understand it and think about it. Now, for us Nazarenes, we have this uh, song called Called Unto Holiness. It's our, it's like a national anthem. We sing it with pride. Not a negative pride, it's a positive pride. It's like uh, you feel like you belong. You feel privileged and honored that God is able to share His nature, His holy nature with you. So we sing it every time we come together. And I know this since I came into the, since God pointed me to this direction, to serve under the Nazarene. I noticed that we only sing this uh, when we come together as Nazarenes. But when I thought about the Word of God, the message of holiness is not a Nazarene message. It's the message of the entire church. And just so you remember, that before you became the denomination you call yourself, whatever name it is that you call yourself, you were a Nazarene because that was the first church. That was the name of the first, the first group that started the Christian church. So you were always a Nazarene, you're still a Nazarene, and you will continue to live as Nazarenes. So this song could be our song if you want to sing it and learn it. It's a beautiful tune. And before I sing it for you, oh yes. And I don't have the voice for it. I I was never a singer and I never will be a singer. I don't know why God didn't think that I should um, should have the ability to sing. But the song, anybody could sing. You don't have to have the voice or reach a note in order for you to sing. Because it's not a song that was intended to just sing it like any other song. You see, we could sing any other song that we want. This one... You only sing it when you mean what you're singing. You are singing your life. You are expressing the life that you live. So if there are any Nazarenes out there watching, uh, you can sing along with me. I'm just going to go sing the first verse in the chorus. Yes, five verses. And maybe next week I'll sing the second one. You can sing along with me. And while you're singing it, Nazarenes, you better love it. Make sure people around you saw, see, and be able to witness the holiness of Christ. Be able to see the fruits of the holy life that is coming out of you. Because you are setting the example. You are leading the way to adding these qualities to your faith. As precious as it is. It's empty of these things until you begin to make every effort under the guidance and the direction of the Holy Spirit to add them. Confirm your faith. Confirm your calling and your election to them. And remind those around you that this is the privilege of every Christian in this life, in the life to come, to share in the holiness of God. Without holiness, no one is allowed to see God. Called unto holiness, church of our God, purchase of Jesus, redeemed by His blood.
Called from the world and his idols to flee. Called from the bondage of sin to be free. Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we marching along. Sing it, shout it, loud and long. Holiness unto the Lord now and forever. Hallelujah. I hope that you come to have what God has intended for you so you can be proud of yourself and live a victorious life, not in defeat, but have the joy of the Lord grow in you every day, not just on Sundays, but every day you live your life in your relationships as a married man and a married woman, as a parent, as children, as a sibling, as a part of the church of God. Makes no difference what name of a denomination that you belong. Holiness is our privilege because God has given us access to his divine nature to grow with him. May the name of our Lord be praised for the gift of salvation and the privilege of holiness. God bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus. I hope and pray that your people are listening in, opening their hearts to you. Without holiness, no one is allowed to see you. Lord, I pray that you give them direction and power, assisting them in their job, in what to do, to confirm their calling and election, to add these qualities into their faith, so they could begin to See victory in you, the joy in you, the peace in you. Father, I thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in my life. The work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of every Nazarene in the world. And I'm not just talking about our denomination. I'm talking about your church as a whole. Because that was the name the world called it when it first started. We are victorious Nazarenes called unto holiness. That holiness is our life and we are proud of it. We take our stand against the world because we believe in our heart that this is the life that we share with you. So when your eternal kingdom comes, we will be welcome. We will receive a rich welcome. To you be the glory, O Lord, in Jesus' name. If there's any one of them that watching this program, opening his or her heart to your word. Well, Father, it's your desire to bring them up in the knowledge. Follow Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for sharing our video, getting the word out to your families and friends. And thank you for those who are supporting us giving us your best wishes, your positive uh, comments, and your questions. We thank you for being a part of our journey together. May God bless you to our local church here in Long Beach. Thank you, church, for your tithe and offering. May God continue to bless you for your love for his ministry. In Jesus' name, tonight at 6.30, we meet again in Samoa. God be the glory. Amen and amen.